Hello? Hey, what's up? It's Baron Drop. I've got Frankie D on the phone, too. Oh, hey. What's up, guys? Hey, so Frankie just called me to see if I had any opinions on the Tarask. Mm-hmm. But tell you what, I figure we can turn this dumb sack of hit points into something that's actually really fun. How about you both craft one, and I'll come up with some stat blocks and solutions or something. That sound good? Hi. Yeah, I can give that a shot. Cool. See you guys later. A Tarask. All right. I guess we better start building. Knowing Frankie, he's probably going to make something really colorful and awesome. What's that? Oh, the other guy? He's the Baron, of course. I think Baron Zemo from the Marvel Universe, but he's really into D&D. Now, for a bit of background, a Tarasque is a mythological creature originating in southern France. It was adopted by D&D lore to be a fearsome creature that is purpose-driven to destroy. It lies dormant, deep in the earth, until its time to feed comes. And then it emerges and wreaks havoc on the world as a sort of cataclysmic natural disaster, akin to modern day hurricanes. It is set to be over 70 feet long from head to tail, so that's gonna put it at around 14 inches long in tabletop scale. Armed with this knowledge, and also the knowledge that I would never outsculp the Frankie D, I chose to go with a more techie route. Keeping the rough dimensions in mind, I started sketching the model in 3D to get a rough outline. You see, my plan is to 3D print this once I finish designing it. What better place than to start with the base? I measured the rough footprint I wanted the final miniature to be, and miniature is heavily in quotes here, and this thing will be massive. Now, the creature's strength is set to be formidable, so I gave it a bulky upper body and a muscular tail section, as well as long arms and legs capable of holding itself up. I arrived at this overall shape. This is likely the most important part of the build, as no matter what detail I add later, if I don't have a good overall shape, the whole thing's gonna end up looking wonky. From here I was using various rock and horn natural stamps in Adobe Medium, and I arrived at this very rocky and primal texture across the monster. Since the lore has it sleeping deep underground, I figured its armor plates would take on the appearance of natural stone to fit in with its environment better when dormant. Now, having no actual predators to camouflage from, and predating time itself, the Tarasque's hide is likely a precursor to the natural formation of the Earth's crust. At this size, with a miniature for scale, I figured the whole thing would be more like a piece of terrain. If you think about the game Shadow of the Colossus here, you have to scale a gargantuan beast as a sort of puzzle in order to defeat it. So I added lots of surfaces to place miniatures so that adventurers could climb on top of the creature as they faced the encounter. And given that the entire monster would be more like a piece of terrain, I opted not to give it a base at all, since I want any players that face this creature to think twice before approaching it like a regular monster. You're not just going to be able to walk up to this thing and start meleeing it. it. It doesn't play by those rules. The whole top carapace could also be removable to add for an element of puzzle solving while the battle rages on. Happy with the results so far? I exported the whole thing and got ready to start printing it. This is where I made a, a silly and costly blunder. I told myself that I should print most of it on a resin printer to bring out all these awesome intricate details that I had sculpted and worked hard on. And also because I had never tried to make something this big for a resin printer, and I liked to see what was involved and the challenges I would face. Well, the first challenge is the size. There is no way to print it in one go, so I started hacking it up into body parts. The torso got sliced in three, tail separated as well. Each leg and arm had two parts to it, and the carapace that would go on top likely needed to be cut as well. To make joining and aligning the parts easier once printed, I sculpted out key slots so that it would sort of slot back together like a puzzle. This would add both mechanical strength and precision in assembly. Alright, now let's start printing. For the first part, I used 4mm thick walls and hollowed it out with 20% infill. And once that was printed, that was a ton of resin used up. Uh, it actually ran out of resin from a full vat, so uh-oh. Alright, next print I learned my lesson. I reduced the infill to 10%, and the walls are now 3mm thick. Better, but this thing is going to be expensive. About 357 hours later? Wow. Okay. Remind me never to do this again. I actually ended up FDM printing the bottom chest plate and the top carapace. And honestly, the detail difference is minimal. I'm going to link the files in the description below, but please just FDM print this if you're going to attempt this project. You're going to save money and time. Now there was some parts that misprinted when the vat ran out of resin, so maybe I could just sculpt this 
a little bit from Polymer Clay. Let me give Frankie a call. Maybe he's got some advice for me. Hey Frankie, I'm looking to fix up this part of the model with some polymer clay. Can I bake it on the model or do I need to detach it? Hey, um... Frankie. Have you noticed how much the Tarasque looks like Bowser from Super Mario? Canarb, I gotta go. It It's Narb. The, the K is silent. Um... Uh, Alright, maybe I can just slice up this part that's missing and just quickly FDM print it. There we go. Alright, now that it's printed, we can actually start having some fun here. The assembly was great, with only some parts being slightly misaligned due to either resin failures or not allowing enough tolerances in my modeling software. Easy enough to fix with a bit of sanding and some super glue and 5 minute epoxy. Gap filling was done with 5 minute epoxy as well, as it provides a rock hard bond and it's quite goopy, so it fills most of the cracks. To give it more consistent texture across the various surfaces, I resorted to adding plaster. Now, this won't bond terribly well to the resin, but after applying it, I came in with water and pretty much washed away most of it from the raised areas. My thoughts are that all the recesses and areas of texture for the plaster to grip onto will give it a good chance of staying on after paint and sealants are applied. <laughs> Taking this thing outside to spray prime was like wrangling a fresh catch from the ocean holding it by its tail so it wouldn't bite me. Now for the paint scheme, looking at some reference images, Tarasks are generally portrayed as having earthy tones, skewed towards red and brown. Had some fun wet blending the various tones and then came in with an airbrush for some pink and orange highlights as well. Now most of the texture was modeled so it'd be easy to dry brush and that's what I did next. Most of the rocky texture was dry brushed with various grays and tan highlights and then unified with a dark wash. I was debating this next step as it had the potential to look quite goofy. I decided to just go for it, and after applying a coat of sealant on the paint job, I started putting clump foliage and flock to parts of the rocky exterior. This is an attempt to add some variety and visual interest. The greenery simulates moss as if the Trask was a massive cliff on a seaside. Adding this type of detail is like telling the story of where the Trask spends its slumber before it emerged into the world. Perhaps it lay just beneath a cliffside on a lake, or in a damp cave. So if you want to hear more of a discussion on how to run a Tarrasque encounter, head on over to Dungeon Masterpiece. Or if you want to see a way cooler hand sculpted Bowser rendition of the Tarrasque, head on over to Frankie D Crafter. Or watch both of them played backwards simultaneously for a hidden message. I'm, I'm kidding about the last part, I think.